Welcome to Bigger Than Sports. I'm your host, Chris Williamson, and joining me today for our latest episode is former Jets general manager and former executive vice president of football operations with the Dolphins, Mike Tannenbaum. You can now see Mike on ESPN as their, one of their NFL front office insiders. Mike, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Great to be with you. And you're a pretty smart guy, as we've seen uh, with the Super Bowl predictions. You are one of few ESPN analysts to predict a Tampa Bay, Kansas City Super Bowl. So obviously, we trust your opinion. Who do you see winning the Super Bowl this year? Well, Chris, I appreciate that because we saw the pick the year before. You wouldn't use those words to characterize me. But, <laughs> you know, I'm going to go with uh, what I said originally. I'm going to go Kansas City. But here's what's really interesting. You know, I always say the definition of greatness is how you impact others. And this will be an opportunity for Patrick Mahomes to show his greatness because both uh, Mitchell Schwartz and Eric Fisher, the outstanding tackles for Kansas City, will be out. Tampa Bay has a good pass rush. So why, like Kansas City, Tampa's front and pass rush against a very beat up chief offensive line is really an interesting part of the game. All right. So it'll be very uh, fascinating to see, you know, how it all shapes out on Super Bowl Sunday. And let's get into, you know, why we brought you here. So you were born in New York, but you went to high school in Massachusetts, followed by going to UMass Amherst before Tulane Law School. At what point did you realize the difference between black and white and how minorities were treated uh, differently than you? You know, for me, um, you know, just along the way, I just was always very open-minded and try to be be like sort of like observant of like what was going on and I think what's really influential in my career Chris was coach Parcells I got to the Jets I'm still like in the formative years I would say of my personal and professional growth you know at UMass I had an African-American roommate I didn't really know any different because I was just always around different people um, but coach Parcells really opened my eyes to a lot of things about being in an environment and a profession where there's going to be people of all different races, origins. And if you want to be successful and it's the right thing to do is you have to be accepting and nurturing of all different types of people. You mentioned the NFL. Uh, you were with the Jets when they hired Herman Edwards, the first black coach in Jets history. What did that mean to the organization to make that uh, step for diversity? You know, I felt uh, great at being in the room. It was. Woody Johnson, Terry Bradway, who's the general manager. I was the assistant GM, and it was like like the first time in my career I was like part of the coaching process. We wanted to get the best guy. Herm, obviously African American, um, has very strong opinions about racial uh, in in inequity, social injustice, and he was by far the best candidate. And he was awesome, and got to work with him for five years, and talked a lot about things. And again, it was it was great for me because. I, I like just being in a position where I'm learning and seeing other people's perspectives because I think that's so healthy. Because um, I think sometimes we default to what's comfortable. And in the NFL, like comfortable is being uncomfortable. You know, that's what the locker room is. Herm was one of those guys that really stood out. He was a leader of men. He treated everyone the same. And he was, he, he really helped change the organization and, um, you know, proud to be part of the people that hired him. And as part of that, you continued on um, with your inclusive efforts, you know, by hiring multiple women um, on the Jets staff, including Jackie Davidson as manager of football operations. And you also promoted uh, Chris Greer, who's black, to be the Dolphins general manager, uh, one of the few black GMs in the NFL right now. What factored into your decisions to make those hires and why was it important for you to help make that type of change? I'm always about the best people. You know, we talk about with players, like the tape sets the floor and the character sets the ceiling. We bought Jackie in a decade ago, Chris, because she had a math background. And I felt like we were too like, our, the consistency of our backgrounds in, in the Jet front office, I, I felt like we had too much of the same, like couple lawyer, and I wanted someone different. And Jackie had a great math background. And that's really why we hired her. You know, this is well before people were talking about analytics, but I knew we could bring strategic planning to a higher level. She walked in the door and we had a superstar, African-American woman, but she earned everything we gave her. And in the most important negotiation I've ever been a part of, the Darrell Reeves pulled out, she sat right next to me because she had a really different way of approaching agents than I did. And I felt like the best result we could get was to have her in the room. And she earned it and she's crushed it and she's doing great in Tampa Bay. Chris Greer, similar situation, I got to Miami. My title there was EVP. We were looking to promote general manager. 
I said to Steve Ross, I'm like, Steve, like we got a great guy right here and Chris that they met and you know, the rest is history. And Chris obviously has done a good job. And I, I think it's always about like being open-minded, making everything like a level playing field and then let the best people succeed. And that gets into my next question. So out of the 32 head coaching positions, there are only three black head coaches uh, in the year 2021, which is very disheartening to say the least. And, and Eric bien uh, Mike, has been arguably the hottest candidate, coaching candidate the past few years, but he keeps getting passed over again. And if you just look at the Super Bowl coordinators on offense and defense, three of the four are black. So in your opinion, based on the expertise that you have, why aren't black coaching candidates getting these jobs when they deserve them, you know, just as much, if not more, sometimes than their white counterparts? Yeah, they should. And, I, and I'll say like in Eric Bieniemy's case, I think his success has actually hurt him. As it relates to Coach Bieniemy, so one of the great fortunes I had in my career, Chris, is between the time I was with the Jets and Dolphins, I actually represented coaches. And one of them I had a chance to represent was Steve Kerr. And Steve, we spent a year getting him ready to go. And he flew around the country, met with Bill Parcells in Saratoga, and Pete Carroll in Seattle, and really wanted to do a great job. And he's obviously gone on and been incredible with Golden State. But what was interesting was in Golden State, the way the NBA does it, it was Alvin Gentry, during the finals, during the finals, got to become the head coach of the Pelicans. And guess what? Golden State's still in the finals. Like, and my point is like, if the league would tweak their rules, I am sure that Eric Bieniemy would be a head coach because I sat there when we hired Rex Ryan and you know, you're, you're rooting for the Ravens to lose in the playoffs so he you could start hiring staff. But what I don't understand to, is this, Eric Bieniemy could have reached an agreement in principle to be the head coach of the Houston Texans 10 days ago and then say the front office, hey, here's like the five or six guys we really got to go get, go get them in terms of coaching staff, and then we'll complete the rest after the Super Bowl. And I think that's like specifically with Coach Bieniemy. to me, that would be the only reason why he doesn't have a job is to start a week from Monday, Chris, just to put your staff together, like you're really, really far behind. So I think the league has to tweak the rules um, so, so the teams that are having these long runs uh, aren't being hurt in terms of being hired. Just to push back on that, I think that's a very interesting point because um, that rule, you know, that a coach who's still playing in the postseason can't get hired until after the season um, didn't prevent, you know, uh, Josh McDaniels, you know, from getting hired as a coach before he, you know, backed out. And then Matt Patricia, obviously, um, with the Detroit Lions coming from the Patriots. Um, so with that being said, uh, do you really think it's about the rules when you have the updated Rooney rule, you have the um, incentive for teams to develop coaches, minority coaches, so that they can um, they'll additionally, they'll get conditional draft picks. Um, so what exactly do you think um, is the real reason? Because it seems like these rules that are in place um, do not affect the front office um, and the ownership, you know, by and large. Yeah, well, I, I think another way to look at it, Chris, is um, I was fortunate enough to uh, teach a class at Columbia this past semester. It was the business of the NFL. We spent one week just looking at all of uh, the Rooney Rule and sort of like social injustice and a lot of like, we, we, we did a lot of different things like playing rules and collective bargaining, but we spent a whole week and we spent a lot of time just drilling down on the Rooney, Rooney Rule and why isn't it effective and collectively, and the students came back with some really good ideas, which was, well, we have to fix a lot of these noteworthy situations, Coach Bianami being obviously at the forefront. But another way I think the league could enhance the situation is, Chris, if you and I are having this conversation five years ago, if the pipeline was better, if there were more entry level and interns that were racially diverse, gender diverse, there'd be more Jackie Davidsons, more Donna Pontes, more JoJo's, more Chris's, because that to me, in five or six years, if that is the case, and we're sitting here in 2026, 2027, it should take care of itself. Like we don't talk about it as much as sports. I think other sports like have a much better uh, entry level sort of program than we do in the NFL. And that's why you see fewer minority you know, um, coordinators. And one other point I would make Chris, where I think Arthur Blank deserves a ton of credit was when the league came out and said that we're gonna do these compensatory picks. I, I was skeptical about it because of the, what happened um, specifically in the NFC South that I was totally wrong. And again, Arthur Blank really deserved credit, which was Terry Fontenot 
is now the African American general manager of the Falcons, and now the Saints are getting at two third round picks. I wasn't sure if that was going to turn out to be the case because if Arthur Blank is sitting there and there's candidate A and candidate B, but my arch rival is going to get two third round picks, is that going to tip the scales the other way? And to Arthur Blank's credit, that did not turn out to be the case. So that, that to me is a positive. So even though guys like Coach Bianami didn't get a job, I think there was some progress on the front office side of it. And just one more question on the NFL coaching cycle. When you look at the NFL owners, all of them um, are white, except for two, you know, with the Bills and the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, how much of that do you think is um, the fact that, you know, black coaches and minorities are not able to get um, as many jobs? How much of that do you think comes down to owners just hiring guys who, you know, may be qualified and deserve the job, but it's just somebody who they relate to more. Every situation could be different. The, the rooms I've been in, it's always and always will be about winning. I wouldn't be in a place, it's too hard. Like, it has to be about winning. And you just hope that the people ultimately making these decisions, the 31 owners, you'll see it the same way. And again, that's why, Chris, to your question, I think the more you can make coaches available, coaching candidates available in a non-interview process will serve the whole process well. How can Coach Vianney be sitting here as an offensive coordinator of a team going for back-to-back -back championships, has a meaningful impact on maybe the best quarterback in the game, Patrick Mahomes, and doesn't have a head coaching job? Like, it, it logically, it doesn't make sense. So you have to say, like, are the interviews being rushed? Like, why, why is it not happening? And if, you know, there was a way for him to, and again, I know there's a sensitivity that owners who may be making a change in the future don't want to be out there saying, hey, we're looking in May for the following year. But if it was a league-wide event where these sort of like conversations happen very naturally, I think that would really, in my opinion, be a meaningful step in the right direction. With everything that has happened in the last few years, beginning with, you know, the Colin Kaepernick kneeling during the national anthem for police brutality uh, to this year with the league posting the uh, in racism, you know, in the end zones or painting them in the end zones and Roger Goodell posting a video explaining that they were wrong about Kaepernick. Do you believe or how do you think the league has handled the racial and social injustice movement um, this year? I, I think it's gone really well. I think they've gone in the right direction. I don't think it's perfect. And I think what um, you know, what's so interesting with the pandemic, you know, a year ago, the collective bargaining agreement passed by like 60 votes, but that created another 10 years of a partnership between the league and the union. And I think because of that, it creates an opportunity for a tremendous partnership. And, you know, right now we're talking about racial and social injustice, and it's great it's a great opportunity for them foundationally to work together to move forward. And hopefully in a couple of years, you know, they're going to be more proactive with things. And again, like to me, that's the best way to solve problems. Like we're talking about some of the more headlines that we certainly need to put band-aids on things like the Rooney Rule and tweak it. But I'm a, a firm believer that if we handle things at the beginning of the process, at the grassroots level, at the entry level, organically over time, the best they're going to rise. And, if it's an equal playing field here, in theory, it should be an equal playing field here. And hopefully in the next couple of years, Chris, we'll see that. We've been doing this show uh, for a few months and we've had on exclusively black athletes, coaches, uh, front office members. So you're the first white guest uh, that we've had on. Um, so we really value the time that you've taken to discuss, you know, these difficult topics. Um, and it's obviously been a turbulent 12 months in America. Um, really turbulent, you know, because there have been things going on for hundreds of years. Uh, but what can people do right now to make tangible change to help in racism? Listen, I like I, I, I be a great listener and go volunteer. Like drives me nuts for my kids. Like when they think they have a bad day, like you think you have a bad day, like, all right, we're going and we're going to work for a day. And I think if, if you're a good listener and, and you volunteer for our country in some meaningful way, like Again, like my perspective, like that's where I've learned the most, being uncomfortable, understanding like a great dose of perspective. And we all have an obligation to give back. You know, Curtis Martin, um, one of the best people I've ever been around besides a Hall of Fame player, that was his expression, to whom much is given, much is expected. And, um, you know, he set an example for so many of us.
Mike Tannenbaum, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate all the perspective and insights that you gave us today to share, you know, about the, the coaching cycle and getting more diverse hires in the NFL. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate you having me. And I know these are topics that aren't always easy to talk about, but it's really important. And hopefully, you know, in the months and years to come, we're going to see meaningful progress.